And I'm very excited today to be with Clint Gibbler. And so I'm very excited to bring his story and the story of his company and open source solutions he's working on to you. But before we do that, we need to know from Clint, who is his favorite superhero and why? Go Clint. <laughs> hey Rich, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I would say my favorite superhero is probably Spider-Man. Um, so I grew up uh, watching the cartoon. Uh, I appreciated how, uh, I guess like acrobatic he was. I thought that like his agility was pretty cool and that uh, being able to swing from webs was kind of like flying. And I think most of all, I appreciated that he was uh, just like a nerd, an engineer. And I think that uh, resonated with me. Yeah, definitely. Um, Spider-Man is one of my uh, favorites. And um, I'm also, I thought, you know, in the MCU, his new, you know, Iron Man-esque uh, enabled AI suit was pretty, pretty cool as well. So yeah, big, definitely a big Spider-Man fan. Yeah. So awesome. Well, now we're going to ask you to tell us all about you. You have great history. I think you're, you have a different history than some of the paths that other security folks have taken. So just tell us, how did you get started in security? You can tell us about your education, career steps along the way, the whole works. Sure. Uh, so I went to uh, Case Western where I got a, a BS in computer science. And um, the way I got into security is actually kind of an accident. Um, so I, uh, Case only had at the time one security class. Uh, it was a grad class, but I, I think as a freshman or sophomore, I just sort of sat in and audited it because I was very curious and uh, really just like, week one or week two, I was like, man, this is amazing. Like I, I was just immediately hooked. And um, really ever since then, uh, I just was trying to uh, like read books, do internships in security. And really that was like, oh man, this is the thing I wanna do. Um, before that, I was actually thinking uh, more like being a video game programmer, but I realized they uh, tended to work insane hours and uh, that industry uh, seemed not the healthiest. Um, but so when security presented itself as something very interesting, I was like, oh man, I'm gonna do that. So I, I did internships during undergrad at um, uh, like a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman that did some cool sort of uh, uh, neat uh, stuff in that space. And then I entered at Sigital, a security consulting firm. Um, and then after I uh, was sort of a senior and about to graduate, I realized I wasn't quite ready to be sort of a real person in the real world uh, doing real things. So I ended up uh, applying to a bunch of grad schools um, and really at that point, um, I was only really looking for schools that had good security programs. Um, and also I realized that as much as I uh, enjoyed Cleveland, it would be nice to not have uh, snow on the ground about nine months a year. So I, I applied to a bunch of schools in California, uh, ended up going to uh, the University of California in Davis uh, for a number of years. Um, and uh, there I did mostly like mobile security, uh, which I don't do as much now, but I did, um, do some like program analysis or sort of static analysis type work. So building tools to analyze um, Android applications in particular. Um, so that's sort of been like a long time uh, love of mine. Um, and yeah, during grad school, uh, interned at Fortify. So a big static analysis company interned at um, Lookout, uh, helping build out their dynamic analysis tooling for like analyzing um, mobile applications. And um, yeah, then graduated, went to the Bay Area, um, Worked at a, um, if you're familiar with, uh, so NCC Group is a big global security consulting firm. They actually had like a like a startup from within the company called uh, Artemis or Domain Services that Alex Damos started yep. uh, and then ended up uh, leaving before I joined. Um, actually, random anecdote uh, you might find amusing is, so I didn't know the connection between those two at the time, but as I was graduating, I... Um, uh, was applying to a number of places, Yahoo, as well as this um, Artemis company. And uh, I, I told the Yahoo recruiter, like, hey, like, I'm sorry, I'm turning this down to, to join this other company. And uh, he's like, hey, let me introduce you to this guy named Alex. Um, he, he wants to convince you. So anyway, so I didn't know that I was about to chat with like the CISO <laughs> at the time. I just thought it was some like random hiring manager guy. I was like, okay, whatever. Um, anyway, so I chat with Alex and then he's like, oh, by the way, the company you're about to join, like, I founded it and you should join my company instead. <laughs> um, so it was kind of funny to be tried to, to be convinced uh, to not join the company from the person who founded it. So that was like a, a random amusing anecdote, but I ended up joining anyway. Then uh, after a bit switched to being a security consultant where I was there for about three or four years. Um, it's very interesting getting to sort of see tons and tons of environments in a short amount of time. Um, so I think that was really formative uh, for me. 
And then, um, yeah, more recently, I've joined uh, R2C, which is a, a Bay Area startup building a, an open source static analysis tool called SEMGRIP. And um, yeah, getting back to my roots of uh, building tools that analyze programs for uh, bugs and other properties. That's a great background. And thank you for walking us through that. And you led right up to, of course, what I want to ask you about. And I think what a lot of people want to hear about. We want to hear about your current company and SEMGRIP as an open source uh, project, um, and particularly with your background in static analysis. Please just tell us more about what's going on there and feel free to go deep. Sure. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of interesting things about R2C and SEMGRIP that um, are maybe not obvious if you're not as familiar with the space. So uh, one thing that's kind of neat is there's actually a long history behind SEMGRIP. So it was uh, originally called SGRIP, and it was built by uh, Yuan Padalu, who uh, was uh, Facebook's first program analysis hire. So he built this tool. They used it to enforce a ton of like secure coding practices within Facebook. He ended up uh, leaving Facebook. And then uh, years later, um, he ended up joining R2C. And uh, R2C actually had a number of different products that were all very different than what we're doing now. And um, he actually made a bunch of uh, improvements to SGREP, uh, which was the original name, now SEMGREP. Um, but it was actually just during a hack week um, where it was like, okay, everyone work on whatever you want. And then he was like, hey, by the way, there's this tool I, I built a long time ago. And that ended up being this massive thing. People loved it. And um, <laughs> we ended up, that's like sort of the core thing our company is building. But it was sort of, you know, the origins are actually a number of years ago. Um, but I, I guess the, um, so the reason I joined R2C, so they were like uh, working on some other stuff beforehand. And to be honest, I don't know if I would have joined if uh, they weren't uh, sort of pivoting to SEMGREP because uh, I saw a huge amount of potential in it based on my personal experience. Um, so like having interned at Fortify and building static analysis tools in grad school, um, there's certainly a lot of value there. Like some people, I think, just write off um, static analysis in general um, because like, oh, it's too noisy. It doesn't do what you want. But I think the important point is like, like static analysis isn't sort of like a binary, like yes or no, you're doing it or you're not. Really, there's like a range in complexity, right? From like, say, grep, which is static analysis. You're just looking for strings all the way to sort of full program analysis where you're doing interprocedural data flow analysis and tracking user input from here to here to here, like 50 things deep. And there's actually like, uh, I think a previously somewhat unexplored middle space, which is more like, you know, much better than grip, but not as heavyweight as the uh, sort of existing big players. And um, basically like, there's an optimization, there's sort of like a, a place in the middle where it's like, okay, like how can we be very fast, but also very intuitive to use? So uh, most tools in my experience take someone with like significant domain expertise, maybe like an academic background, or at least weeks of learning sort of the custom domain specific language that they use. And so really, I think the one of the most key exciting insights is like, okay, well, how do we make someone who's just a normal security engineer or a normal developer able to build um, basically a very powerful linter that can capture either uh, security properties or sort of correctness or robustness things as well. And really, um, I think of it kind of like democratizing static analysis. Like how can we take this thing that's like very useful and powerful and just make everyone uh, sort of a rock star and able to do it pretty well. Um, so really, I think um, just like I don't know. I don't know exactly what the feature matrix would be, but if it was like, well, like, how do we optimize for like speed, ease of learning, uh, rapid prototyping, um, almost, yeah, just sort of like a tool for people who are a bit technical and competent and willing to uh, roll their own a little bit. Um, whereas I think previous approaches were sort of heavyweight standalone big boxes that you put stuff in, you get stuff out, and it's very hard to customize and adapt to an environment. So we just sort of went all the way in the other direction, I think, for it. That's that's great, and I think we'll drill into that a bit. And so maybe we can talk about the open source. Uh, you know, you've even done. I've seen you've done a little bit of contribution um, contribution yourself, even. But maybe you can tell us about the community a little bit around SEMGREP. Who are these people? Are they developers? Are they security people? And how important has that been for the company as well to have this great open source solution? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um... So one, I think other big differentiator uh, for other approaches is, um, so historically the, um, the engine uh, is closed source for many tools and the rules are closed source as well. Um, and then more recently, um, CodeQL has a closed source engine, but open source rules. And I think to my knowledge, uh, SEMGREP is the only tool that both the engine and the rules are open source. Um, so I think that's a pretty neat differentiator. 
Um, but yeah, I think that because it's open source, that sort of just appeals uh, to developers and security professionals more because they're like, ah, like I like knowing how things work. I like being able to uh, extend it. And um, yeah, it actually has caused a, a number of people to just sort of do drive-by contributions for the rules. They're like, hey, like I found this XXE in our repo. Here's the thing. Like I hope other people uh, can benefit from it. So um, yeah, it's been very neat. I would say. Um, once we got a, a certain amount of uh, traction, uh, a lot of our work is actually uh, very sort of uh, user pulled, where people are like, hey, I really want to be able to do this. And we're like, okay, cool. Let's take all the different asks people have and create sort of a, a intuitive way to solve this same problem. Um, so yeah, I think it's in a, a very fortunate position. Um, it, it, uh, it didn't start that way. It took a lot of hard work and a lot of um, just being very responsive on Slack. Uh, we have a community Slack where people are always asking questions and we try to give people answers for um, like they're like, hey, in my code, this is a pattern I wanna find and it doesn't quite work, can you help me out? And um, we generally try to respond to people like pretty quickly, like in like an hour or two, maybe less um, because we have a, a bunch of people sort of constantly watching um, as they go about building other stuff. Um, so yeah, I think it's just um, making people feel empowered and enabled to um not just rely on what we provided like we've tried to take sort of the hard lame parts uh, about matching code uh, and mostly abstracted that away into an engine so you can just like hey i'm trying to do my job we just got a bug bounty report for something i don't want to find again um or show me all the other places that this occurs like and just sort of trying to empower people to to do that on their own without sort of being blocked on i don't know some quarterly update or something it's like no just you do your thing we'll, we'll support you that's that's a great model how much of the contribution from the community is rules or that kind of content versus, you know, core engine sort of stuff? Yeah, I would say uh, contributions are more rules than engine. Um, so engine improvements in general are hard. Um, and that's, um, I would say it's easier for SEMGRIP than in other cases. Well, at least it's possible because it's open source. Other, other tools, it's like not even possible. But um, so just to, I guess, to give you sort of an overview of the different parts. So uh, SEMGRIP rules are uh, YAML, which has uh, one or more parts that are like patterns where it's like, okay, find this thing in the code. Um, and you can combine patterns using Boolean logic where you can say, you know, find this and this or this or this or this, but not that. Um, and then some other metadata for like, if you find it, what should you tell users? Like, hey, this was the issue, here's how to fix it, stuff like that. Um, so there's the rules, which is YAML. Uh, and then there's a SEMGREP uh, tool itself, which is sort of like two parts actually. So there's like a Python layer on top that handles like the CLI stuff. And then uh, the core work, uh, workhorse of it is actually OCaml, um, <laughs> because it turns out if you're building a program analysis tool, um, those people, you know, people with the PhDs and those tend to like OCaml. That's, that's just sort of a fun fact. Right. Um, but yeah, so um, so that obviously like writing OCaml and parsing and sort of the core program analysis work tends to be harder. Um, but one thing I've, I've honestly been surprised by is we have gotten a number of contributions in that. Um, so some people were like, hey, we really want um, like C-sharp support. So we're gonna start adding support for that. Uh, same with Rust. Um, I think same with Lua. Um, and actually, uh, what's especially cool is this one company is like, hey, we really use this one uh, niche language, uh, Hackling. And so they're actually hiring some interns to add support for Hackling to SEMGRIP uh, as part of this project. So other companies are paying their developers or their engineers to add things to SEMGRIP, which I think is pretty cool. That's, that's fantastic. Again, that's a, a great model. Um, and so I just think that I can see the content thing really taking off. So want to kind of switch gears a little bit, and this is more maybe with your, maybe with your pure security hat on, um, you know, the speed of cloud native development, right? Uh, small teams distributed, a lot of freedom and responsibility, right? Not centralized. So if you think about like how I've rolled out, I've bought Fortify a number of times and rolled it out this, the Fortify world, very different than the SEMGREP uh, world. What have you seen in terms of the changes that Cloud Native brings, and particularly in operationalizing something like SEMGREP, right? So I'm, let's say I'm, I'm a CISO, I've got a, a large distributed team of developers. Am I the one who's bringing in like a, a SEMGREP or is it somebody else? And, you know, again, understanding the velocity of Cloud Native development 
what does it really mean to operationalize something like SEMGRAP? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and one thing we've been seeing is that it's really um, not just a technical problem. It's certainly like a like an interorganizational and um, like political dynamics. Like, what's the relationship between sort of the security team and engineering and so forth? Um, I guess it also comes back to like, what is the model? Like, what is your intended use case for the tool? And like, what is the output and what happens to it? Um, so I think traditionally what happens in um, say Fortify or check marks or tools like that is generally the um, security team uh, is either scheduling or running the scans maybe daily, weekly or something like that. And then they triage the uh, results and then the things they believe are true positive, they then communicate to developers. Meanwhile, developers have sort of moved on and, and are doing other things. And maybe you block a release or something uh, on that. Um, some companies try to send results directly to developers. In my experience, that almost never goes well, right. um, at, at least with those tools when I've uh, helped other companies as a consultant do that. Um, I think so like what we're trying to do is, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very like, a, a, I, I'm, I'm gonna regret saying this, but like shift left. So like, how do we, you know, make it easy to comment on pull requests? Um, how can we make it easy for like an individual developer to add um, SEMGRUP to CI, whether that's uh, GitHub Actions, Travis, GitLab uh, and so forth. Um, I will say one thing I've seen that's interesting in a number of companies is uh, you do need some sort of engineering buy-in to add another tool to CI um, because generally uh, engineering is responsible for like speed and uptime and like correctness uh, of the CI pipeline so you don't slow things down. Um, so again, that's sort of why we prioritize being fast. Um, another thing that I think is interesting is we try to make it very easy. And you said about uh, operationalizing, like a lot of times, um, well, I guess here's here's what I think is semi best practice about rolling static analysis in general, not SEMGRUP specific, just any tool. It, like first, it's like okay, well, let's choose like a representative set of uh, repos that use like the tech stacks our company tends to use, that use whatever CI and code hosting we tend to use because uh, medium to big companies tend to have like seven different uh, CI providers and uh, code hosting, and it's like everywhere. Um, so choose like a rep representative sample. Um, add it to a couple of repos and then like, okay, let's sort of do watch only mode where we're not going to block the build. We're maybe not even gonna show developers the results, just the AppSec team or ProdSec team is gonna consume it asynchronously. Um, and then over time, as you build confidence in this, um, maybe you gradually start like say writing a PR comment um, to say, hey, like I found this thing and maybe you're not blocking the build, but more of like an FYI and people sort of feel maybe some obligation uh, to fix it if how to fix it is clear and if it seems like a real issue. And then maybe over time you then um, block the build for things you're very confident on, like say 90 plus percent confident. Um, so I would say in general, like let's try a couple representative repos, uh, just watch, don't even alert, and then maybe scale it out to everything and just watch, not even alerting or blocking, and then gradually maybe developers see the results and then maybe gradually you start blocking the bill. But that sort of like iterative process is a way to get security coverage and visibility without uh, blocking or annoying developers while also giving you some like better just uh, security posture and sort of mitigating some risk there. So. I would say in general, that's a good approach for any tool. Um, and that's something that we've basically tried to build very easily into the product. So you have that flexibility. You can say these repos scan with these rules, these things write a PR comment, these other things don't just send me a Slack message um, or things like that. So I don't know, that's a, a long-winded way to answer you, but maybe, maybe that no, addresses it. It's great. And it reminds me of what it was like over 10 years ago to maybe 15 years ago to introduce early web application firewalls. Mm -hmm. Like if you said, okay, hey, we're gonna turn this on and start blocking stuff. It's like, that's a great way to get it turned off, actually get it ripped out, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I could imagine people might think, hey, you know, we're gonna go ahead and put this great tool in. We're gonna start writing PR, you know, writing to, you know, Git or whatnot. Um, and that is a good way to, you know, potentially be obnoxious to developers and a good way to get something turned off as well. So it's kind of funny how things change and yet how things stay the same. So yeah, totally. this leads to my next question really well. You had, I, it was a talk you did. Um, I think it was a talk you did. I looked through your, your site, started looking at some of your materials in preparation for this. And you, you had a, a you know, guard, uh, you know, it was guardrails 
uh, versus, well, guardrails, not gatekeepers, I think is the term you use. Guardrails, not gatekeepers. And uh, it was part of an OWASP talk, I believe, that you gave. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that. So it was part of an opinionated guide to scaling your company's security. And you emphasize you know, guardrails, not gatekeepers. Could you speak a bit more to what you were talking about there and how that even relates to what you were just speaking about moments ago? Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, to give uh, credit where credit is due, that's definitely uh, highly influenced by uh, my friends on the Netflix team. Um, so like Asta, Scott, uh, Travis, and, and many others. Um, so not, not necessarily my idea, but something I've heard consistently uh, from a bunch of people who I think are very smart and who I trust. Um, so I, I guess um, sort of goes back to, I think, how development has been changing and how security has been changing as well. So if we think back, say, to like early 2000s, um, if you're building a web application, for example, in Rails, you would have to like add a little helper to say, like, make sure you output and code this. Um, so anywhere that you don't remember that thing, it's going to be vulnerable. And I think you see that in general for like CSERF and all these different things. So I think early web, it's like, you need to remember to do a thing to not be vulnerable. But uh, more recently, um, a lot of frameworks uh, are pretty good. And if you just use the defaults, it's going to be like secure by default. Um, or uh, as I also call it, sort of like guardrails or paved road, as Netflix calls it. And I guess sort of the, the key insight is like really just, I, th I think this is not just security, this is just safety in general. Like, um, and it goes back to sort of like habits and just like how people work, right? Like you don't um, want to make it like very complicated for your airbag to like save you <laughs> if you get <laughs> if you get hit or something, right? It's like like how can we sort of engineer all that complexity internally so it's sort of transparent uh, to the user? So similarly, uh, we don't want uh, developers to be have to be sort of security experts because that's you know years of study, lots of work. There's always new attacks. There's always new things. So basically, like. How can we enable developers to do what they're best at, which is to uh, produce features on time, to uh, meet business goals, to build scalable, robust performance systems? Like, there's all these things that I think, as security professionals, at least me, I'm certainly not good at, or at least not as good as like an average developer. So, how can we enable them to do what they're best at, and uh, as much as possible, just not have to care about security? And at least when they do, like, make it clear to them when they need to care about security, and then maybe they reach out and ask for help. So, fundamentally, like development is happening faster and faster. You know, many companies are pushing production many times a day. We just fundamentally can't do the approach we used to, which is like, you can't push until I say yes. Like you could try that, but there's, you know, a thousand developers and two or three of you. So um, basically a lot of it comes down to like business risk and like business goals, right? So what is the cost to the business of delaying uh, features uh, being pushed versus, you know, how much uh, risk are we mitigating by uh, manually reviewing all the code reviews? So, right. the, so the idea is like, okay, so how do we scale uh, a security team with few headcount? Um, okay, well, let's just build secure primitives, um, secure libraries, secure wrapper frameworks or services that if developers use it, 90% of the time it's safe. And when it's not safe, we have sort of lightweight checks to find those cases. Like when are you opting out of the prote uh, protections we're providing? Um, and uh, SEMGREP, I think, because it's sort of lightweight and customizable, I think is a good fit for that. But really, I think the principle is like, you know, we can't slow down developers too much, but we still want to scale security. So how do we make it easy for them to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing? Right. Um, and there's a bunch of talks uh, that I think are great about this. Like, uh, there's a couple of good Netflix talks. The Google SRE book uh, calls this out as well. Microsoft had some studies uh, about it. Facebook has a nice blog post about like how sort of secure defaults and secure frameworks are sort of the base of their sort of security posture. And they do the other things too, but that's like what they try to eliminate the most risk. So really, I think this is just uh, rapidly converging sort of best practice across like most companies who I think have spent a lot of time thinking about this. That's fantastic. And that was a really great way to summarize and wrap up the whole train of thought from your, you know, from Spider-Man to who you are, to your company, to, to this. So Clint, this has been really helpful. I think this is great, great content and information for, for security folks at large and, and more. Um, for those of you out there who are listening, definitely check out R2C and SEMGREP, even consider contributing. I think, I think for, at least from my perspective, this is the wave of the future. Um, in many cases, it's what's going on right now, but I think it's the wave of the future for the enterprise. So again, really thankful to have you here, Clint, and I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Rich. Great.